Well, back in the day, people knew Mondo De La Vega was a gang member the second they saw him, from tattoos to the way he dressed, but not anymore. Mondo's incredible journey has taken him from gangster to grace. Mondo De La Vega is an executive producer at the PTL Network and hosts his own show. One would never guess the kind of life he once lived. Escaping abuse and violence in Central America, Mondo's mother took her kids to Los Angeles. The gangs there welcomed teenage Mondo with open arms. In My Crazy Life, Mondo tells how God took an angry, bitter young man and turned him into a loving husband and father. This is a great book. It really is My Crazy Life. I really it was, found a very compelling reading. Thanks for thank being you. with us, Mondo. Man, Andrew, thank you for having me. you got to say it, Mi Vida Loca. My Mi Vida Loca. Life. All right. You say it a lot better, obviously. <laughs> it, it's a fascinating life, yeah. okay, and we've got a lot to talk about. But you're six years old. Life's good. Central America, right? But then you wake up to a horrific situation in your home. What was going on? You know, my father had never yelled at me, never cussed at me. My father was my hero. He was my champion. He was, man, dads are everything, mm. you know? So to wake up and see my father beat my mother with a broomstick, cussing at her and beating her, I knew something was different. Something wasn't making any sense. Yet, I thought my life was perfect. Everything was going well up to that moment, not realizing that my father had done this before. Okay. But this time around, it happened in front of us, and he couldn't stop himself. And began to get his frustrations out of my mother. And in the corridor, I'm standing, and I'm watching my mother get beat my, by my hero, mm -hmm. not being able to do anything about it. So the birth of anger and hate and vengeance, that was the birth of that moment. And I remember telling my old man at six years old, I cannot wait when I get older I'm going to kill you for what you did to my mother. Because you also heard him say something that night. Absolutely. What did, he, what did he say to her that hurt you so bad? I don't want them anymore. And I'm thinking, what did I do to you for you not to want me? And, and it caused, and, and as a six-year-old, that's why I tell people, be careful what you discuss in front of your kids, because your kids might catch the first glimpse, the middle, or the last of the conversation without putting it into context. Well, I grabbed those last words out of context that hunted me for years. And what happened to you next could be a book in itself. You and your mom and your sister are on the run in Central America from your father. I used to think life can change in 24 hours. But after writing this book, I realized my life changed in seconds. In seconds, we went from being a family to in seconds, that will be the last place I will call home. That will be the last time we will be a family. Now, you got to go back. In the middle of that crisis, a civil war breaks out in the Americas, a civil war that is destroying every town, is destroying El Salvador, is, is destroying Guatemala, is destroying Honduras. And, and over a million refugees fled that civil war. We were three of those million people. How can that be? We're in the, on the run. I'm, I'm, I'm witnessing homes being burned, people being raped, people being beaten, people being arrested. At six years old, I'm watching this as we're on the run from my father, and yet no one is stopping and saying, how are you doing? Is everything okay? Then you're eight years old. You finally get to the United States. You're in L.A. Yeah. You're eight years old. What, you're looking out the window, and you see what? Gang members. Doing what? Beating. This time it's not a broomstick, it's a baseball bat, you know. And when you understand what that looks like, I saw it from afar. But the problem is, I was not afraid of it. I got excited. I was like, what's going on? I, I, I want to see that. I want more. How do you get that power? This kid was being disciplined because the gangs have rules. And when the gangs have rules, they discipline you in order to send the message to the rest of the gang. As I'm watching this, I'm watching and saying, I want to be a gangster. And they embraced you, right? And 11 years old, you went through a horrific initiation. 11 years old, I write about it in my book, The Baptism of the Soul, and I get jumped in. Eight, nine, and 10, I'm getting lured in. I'm being romanced. Well, they beat you to a pulp at 11 years old, right, for your initiation? Years old, yeah. Initiations, it's what, it's what changes everything. They want to see if you have the heart to be a gangster. They want to see if you can take a beating from the police or 
your enemies out there. They want to know if, if you're going to understand what it's going to be to be a gangster, if you're going to have the heart to do what they're asking you to do. So four, six guys come in. They jump you in for what it feels a lifetime, and it's only seconds. I went in as an angry, innocent kid. By the time I got up out of the floor and I'm beat up and bleeding and, and whatnot, uh, I was raced out of the floor, and now I'm a fierce wolf waiting to get vengeance on anything and anyone that came against us. Yeah, well, you had all those qualities because people may notice you have some little tattoos, right? Tell yeah, us about those. Yeah, mi vida loca is the three dots. Is my crazy life is the three dots, the three roads that the destination of a gangster leads you to. Where's that on your face? The three dots. Let me see if I can see that right. Right here, the three dots. What do they stand for? Mi vida loca, my crazy life, and I titled it, you know, my book is titled because of that, but it's the three roads that the gang leads you to. One, one, one dot is you're going to end up in the hospital, either paralyzed or in a coma. Dot number two will be uh, doing prison for life or the ultimate death. Can you imagine being told every single day by society, lock them up and throw the key away? Then with your own homeboys, they remind you, don't make plans past 18 years old because you're not going to live that long. Either you're going to end up in prison, either you're going to end up in the hospital in a coma, or you're going to be dead. Mm -hmm. So in your mind, you can't see past 18 years old, let alone you can't see past the next day. That's why I never saw myself as a father. I never saw myself as a husband. I never saw myself as a, as a citizen in, in, in a community. And, and all I saw myself as, if I can live through today, then I'm okay. But I'm going to live to the best of my ability. That means survival mode. That means violence. That means dodging bullets. That means everything that the gang expects you to do, yet no one knew I was in pain. So you lived this way for years, and one day your gang had a job for you to do, but you said, wait a second, fellas. I promised my <laughs> sister I'd go to church, yeah. and you're literally, you walk into a church in obligation to her, and you're carrying a couple of weapons with you. Yeah. Tell me about that day, I think the, my sister took a chance, took a risk to walk in and said, what if God is real? What if prayer works? What if you have a different destiny? 24 hours ago, my destiny was being, li leaving my, my, my vida loca. Prison, death, or uh, in the hospital. Now you're giving me hope? I said yes to God when my sister made me an offer I couldn't refuse, right? Uh, and I walked into a church. I walked in with my 9 millimeter Berettas, locs on, bandana on, thinking she set me up. Yet she set me up in a different way because the preacher that was giving the message was a former gang member himself that was one of my enemies, once my enemies. Can you imagine seeing an enemy now preaching and you're trying to, what is happening? What happened to this guy? Yet he presents the gospel to me. I accept the gospel and, and, and it's kind of difficult how it happens, but the next day, changes everything because now I have to go up to my homeboys, to my leaders, to my OGs, to let them know, to give them a report. I'm not going to be on the job no more. Well, it doesn't happen that way because you can't just walk away from a gang. There's a lot on the, uh, on the line, yet I let them know what happened the night before. Shotgun in my back, a pistol in my forehead, and another pistol in my chest. But I knew that the power I had felt, the power of the Holy Spirit had got a hold of me. And that night I fell in love with Jesus. For some people, it's a Sunday morning experience. And I, for me, it was life or death. Now, what am I going to do for a living? Well, you found the love of Christ. You embraced the Lord in the church that day. And then talk about destiny. It's remarkable. You find yourself in the Dream Center in California and... Who did you meet that you established a fascinating relationship with that brought Man, you to where you are today? You know, what's so funny is that you never know what's going to happen in your life when you say yes to God. I ended up serving at the, uh, serving my life, you know, in servanthood at the Dream Center with Tommy Barnett and Matthew Barnett that believed in me. Mm -hmm. And I was the driver picking up people. And who do I pick up? A guy named Jim Baker. I have no idea who Jim Baker is. All I knew was, this guy's different. 
because Jim Baker asked me a question that most guys didn't ask me when I picked them up from the airport. That question was, hey, can you take me downtown? I need to go thank the guy that is running the L.A. mission. And I'm looking, uh, Mr. Jim, they don't like white people down there. Are you sure you want to go down there? He said, no, I need to go down there. You're with me, right? And I'm thinking, oh, Here man, he just compromised the both of us. But I said, okay, we'll go down there. I parked the car, and as soon as I get out, people started recognizing him. Man, that's Jim Baker. Man, Jim Baker, man, you changed my life. Jim Baker, man, I watched you on TV, man, Jim. And I'm thinking, I'm moving from being a, a driver to now a bodyguard, not realizing who this guy was. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, over 100 people just surrounded us. Jim, we got to get in and get out. We move fast, we get in the car, and I said, man, you famous or something? He said, I used to be. And he put his head down and he said, uh, I'm infamous now. I had no idea what infamous meant. I said, no, man, you're a superstar, dog. I said, everybody knows your name, man. Look what you did. As a matter of fact, why are you here? He said, well, I, I, I wrote a book called I Was Wrong, and I have to go and do an uh, interview with Larry King. I said, man, you superstar, man. Only famous people go there. He said, uh, I used to be. He put his head down and he says, can you please take me to the hotel? And then I got to get ready to speak. I didn't realize who this man was that was going to change my life. It's been incredible. It's been incredible. And it's brought Mondo to where he is today. I want to let you know his book is called My Crazy Life, and it is a phenomenal, compelling read. It's available wherever books are sold. Mondo, thanks so much for being with us Thank today. you. I really appreciate, I appreciate it. appreciate your time. Amazing testimony. We'll be back with more 700 Club Interactive right after this. Stay with us.